Okay, let's pick up with our part four. We're talking about slavery today. There are two prior videos in this series that you should check out first if you're just tuning in. So in any case, with part three, we're talking about the conditions of slavery uh, and some forms of slave resistance. So in any case, uh, this map highlights the expansion of slavery from the really the ratification of the Constitution until the outbreak of the Civil War. So just notice uh, that in between the years of 1790 and 1860, the slave population grew from 700,000 to 4 million. So that is a dramatic increase, right? And we see some other maps and charts from the previous two videos from this series that, that highlight some of those statistics as well. Right. Uh, with the expansion of slavery, we see an expansion, of course, of slave culture, right, and a distinctive um, African-American community that comes along with it. Right. We'll talk about that more as we move forward. Uh, and when the international slave trade is abolished in 1808, we also see the reliance on natural increase to expand the slave population. Natural increase is just another way of saying that slaves now uh, were reproducing at home, right? They could no longer rely on importing slaves from places like West Africa and the Caribbean. They had to increase their slave population domestically, right? So there's going to be an increased value in female slaves of childbearing age as a result of this, right? And this is going to be very problematic, especially from the female perspective in African American history. In any case, uh, the challenges to slavery are abound, right? We're going to see that, well, we'll talk about, we'll actually talk about some of this in a little, in a little while, but one of the things we experience, first of all, is that uh, the conditions of slavery are a matter of life and death in many ways, right? Uh, the life expectancy for African Americans was significantly lower than that of whites, although interestingly, at least in certain areas, the infant mortality rate was lower, and, uh, there are reasons for that, but without, I'll, I'll just move on from there. Feel free to ask about that. But in any, in any event, right, uh, about 75% of all slaves worked as field hands, right? So they worked outdoors, right? They worked incredibly long hours, most of the time from sunrise to sunset, with little or no breaks in between. Women, oftentimes, who were working as field hands would work even while pregnant, well into the end of their pregnancy. In fact, a woman, it was not unheard of for a woman to give birth and then return to the field that exact same day, right? And so women had the double burden of oftentimes not only working merely, uh, virtually to death, but also to tell, take care of child rearing. And in addition to that, I know I'm not painting a rosy picture here, but many African women, African American women were also expected to, if they were domestic slaves, they were expected to take care of the white children in the household as well, even including breastfeeding the white children, right? So that meant that if, uh, if a slave woman gave birth at a similar time to her mistress, she would use her own breast milk to nurse her mistress's babies. All right, again, not a rosy picture, but the idea behind that is that slaves often would let their own children go hungry in order to use their own resources, right, as natural as it gets, to feed someone else's kids, right? In any case, what we see is that, just going back to this, uh, that we also see poor living conditions, meager housing, lack of adequate clo clothing, um, you see the lack of a normal childhood for those who did survive, right? Children are very quickly exposed to the harsh conditions of the realities of slavery. It was not uncommon for children when playing, actually, to simulate things like slave auctions, because to them it was a normal part of life. A child, uh, it was very common for a child to be separated from their natural family, right? Or, or adults for that matter, right? Marriages were not legal in the institution of slavery, so husbands and wives could be sold apart. Children could be sold apart, right? Uh, it was not uncommon for a child to not be completely confident of who their true birth parents were. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we also see that uh, many, uh, many slave cultures actually were uh, raised their children in more of a kinship network rather than a rather than a small nuclear family so the idea was that many slave families sort of identified uh, members of their larger community as brothers and sisters even if they weren't actual direct siblings because the idea was that everyone was in the child rearing and uh 
a, a just a social preservation effort together, right? There, there's the old phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. And, and, and this was clearly apparent in slave culture, right? Um, it's also important for us to realize that the sort of the balance between upper south and northern, uh, rather upper south and lower south is going to shift over time once we get closer to the outbreak of the Civil War. We looked at this a little bit in the previous videos, but realize that the upper south, right, areas like Virginia in particular, uh, were previously the economic stronghold of the slave owning uh, states, right? So the tobacco industry was much more predominant in places like Virginia and North Carolina, but with the development and growth and expansion of the cotton industry, we see that the economic stronghold starts to shift farther south. And most notably, it's going to be located in places along the Mississippi River, right? Um, and so this is really significant. We're going to see that the slave population is going to be in much higher demand in places like this. And so many slaves in more northern areas were also vulnerable to being sold, quote, down the river, end quote. And the meaning behind that was that they were uh, most likely going to see much more severe working conditions. If you worked on a cotton or rice plantation, the work was arguably much more backbreaking, partially because the demand for that product was that much higher, right? And so, and also the, uh, the general life expectancy was much lower the farther south you got. And so be, to be sold down the river in the eyes of some slaves was literally a death sentence, right? Uh, in addition to uh, the problems that are associated with uh, the geogra geography of slavery, of course, just the nature of how they worked was very problematic. You see the development of gang systems of labor, right? If you're familiar with prison chain gang, this is really where the legacy starts, right? So slaves oftentimes were actually chained together while doing their work. And the idea behind that was to make it much more difficult for them to escape, uh, to make it so that it was much more easy for them to be supervised, right? And also, of course, the idea of just sheer humiliation. The idea that if they were chained together, that they were treated the same way that uh, cattle would be treated, right? Uh, so nonetheless, this chain gang system of labor was very effective in controlling the slave population and making it that much more difficult to stage a revolt, right? But uh, we do see many examples of the preservation or the attempt at least of a preservation of African-American culture, which is very, very significant because the institution of slavery is really one of the darkest, I think, I'm sorry, but I'm going to just say it. It is one of the darkest periods in American history. And the fact that there is this very strong culture that results from it is one of the major uh, uh, survival stories uh, that we should celebrate in American history, right? Um, so in terms of uh, the preservation of culture, religion is one of the major developments that we see here, right? So at least uh, culturally or politically even, uh, most African-American religions were forbidden at least to be expressed in public, although you did see many slaves develop their own religions anyway. Some slaves, it really depended on their relationship with their master's family, right? But some slaves did attend church with their masters. But more commonly, uh, religion was segregated, right? And the areas where African-American American religion was legal, uh, there was a separate black church that was developed, right? Uh, African American religion spread along with the emergence of the Second Great Awakening around the turn of the 19th century. You're going to see the appeal of evangelical and gospel-oriented churches, right? Uh, this is also significant. We'll talk about the Underground Railroad in a little bit, but the religious connection to the resistance effort, whether it is symbolic resistance or literal resistance, is really key here too. You're probably familiar with some of the Underground Railroad uh, language, some of the old slave spirituals that refer to the North Star in particular. The idea behind that is that even the escape route had a religious significance to it, right? Many slaves sang about the land of Canaan, right? And this is, of course, the biblical promised land for the, for the uh, Israelites who fled Egypt, right? So there actually was a, a sort of a biblical reference that many slaves used when referring to their desire to be free, right? Uh, so in any case, what we see is that the development of religion was really offering the possibility of at least spiritual freedom because slaves realized that the difficulty of actually escaping was almost insurmountable, right? Only about 1,000 slaves out of the... Mm, four-ish million slaves that lived in the South uh, escaped every year, right? Successfully, at least, right? Many others escaped and then were subsequently caught. 
Um, so religion gave them the ability to feel like they had an active role in their lives instead of having to succumb to this sort of passive role in the slave system. Right. But speaking of passive roles, there were some. Right. It's important for us to recognize two different slave personalities. Right. That have persisted largely to this day in some uh, in some sort of pop culture references, which are pretty problematic. Right. First, among the male population, you have the Sambo personality. Right. This is sort of the stereotype of the jovial slave. Right. The very happy slave. Right. You see this uh, uh, this caricature of uh, Sambo personality here, the very exaggerated smile, the very exaggerated Af African features. Right. And of course, the telltale sign of the happy Sambo personality. And this is uh, one of the legacies of, of sort of, I guess, just these racial stereotypes, right, with a slice of watermelon, right? So uh, without further ado, this is sort of illustrating the Sambo personality. And then you have the Mammy personality, which is more indicative of the female slave. And this is sort of the, um, the very maternal, right? Also, most of the time, very happy, but also a lot of times had this sort of storied uh, and uh, large personality, right? This is, if you're familiar with this image, this is a still from Gone with the Wind, right? And, uh, oh, forgive me, but I'm blanking on this actress's name. She actually, uh, she was nominated for Best Actress? No, she didn't win because the first black woman didn't win Best Actress for decades and decades afterwards. But nonetheless, the actress that played uh, the Mammy figure in Gone with the Wind uh, was widely recognized for her role. But nonetheless, the role was very problematic, of course, as we can tell, because it really perpetuated the stereotype. And we could, I talked about how there are long-term uh, ramifications of this. In particular, I think about the Mammy personality and the tie to things like the Aunt Jemima, uh, uh, the Aunt Jemima personality, right? The Aunt Jemima syrup, and also the the Pine Sol cleaning lady, even, right? So, uh, this this does have long lasting, uh, uh, pr uh long lasting pop culture stereotypes that are associated with it. Another form of resistance was literally running away, right? So fugitive slaves um, were seen as a problem among the slave o the slave owning population, right? There was a fugitive slave law that was passed initially with the ratification of the Constitution. You're going to see, we'll get to this later, but in 1850, there's going to be a tighter fugitive slave law that's passed. And this is important because even northern states were obligated to at least they were obligated legally to capture and return runaway slaves who found their way to northern states. But with the development of the Underground Railroad and also what we call personal liberty laws, you're going to see that a lot of northern states are going to just find their own ways to resist these fugitive slave laws as the Civil War becomes inevitable. But nonetheless, these two uh, posters, these primary sources here, show us that there was uh, sometimes significant cash rewards that were associated with uh, fugitive slaves. Um, and then the Underground Railroad, right? Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about this and then we'll pick up with, I suppose, one more video. Yeah, we have a few more to go. So let's, uh, let's just talk about the Underground Railroad here quickly and then we'll pick up with one more. Um, so this is, hopefully you recognize her, right? Iconic figure, the future face of the $20 bill. Uh, Harriet Tubman, right, who at the age of 28, I want to say, began leading these back and forth uh, journeys from, in many instances, the deep south all the way past the north in many circumstances, right, all the way to the Canadian border. Because after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was passed, you're going to see that even the northern states were not completely safe to ru for runaway slaves. So nonetheless, Harriet Tubman, the fact that she was willingly risking her life multiple times to help basically assist other runaway slaves in the Underground Railroad is just, is just this... Uh, triumph of human accomplishment, arguably, in history. Now, the Underground Railroad was not as organized as some people. Uh, I mean, it was organized socially, but it wasn't something where there were these planned out maps necessarily, partially because the participants in the Underground Railroad didn't want to get caught, right? And so it was actually much more secretive than, than some people uh, some people sort of preconceive. Um, for people who aren't in my class, I recommend that you go to some of the History Channel resources on this. They're really helpful. And this is uh, the author of our textbook, Eric Foner, talking through some of the significant elements of the Underground Railroad. So I'll leave that for you to check out at your own leisure. Um, we'll pick up with uh, 
one more video here. Actually, you know what? We can get through this. It's going to be a little longer, but let's just do it. Um, let's talk about one more form of resistance here, uh, and this is the more uh, or the more violent one, either an attempt at or an actual implementation of a rebellion or a mutiny. We talked about Gabriel Prosser and Denmark VC's conspiracies earlier, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about those, but just for our continuity, uh, for continuity's sake, let's just acknowledge that there were previous slave conspiracies that did not actually result in rebellions. You had in 1800 Gabriel's Rebellion, right, um, which never actually occurred. It was just a planned rebellion. Gabriel Prosser and other conspirators were caught and hanged. Denmark Vesey, he was a freed black man who also planned a rebellion that never occurred, and he was executed along with other conspirators in 1822. The first actual rebellion right? So textbooks oftentimes actually mislabel Gabriel and Denmark VC's rebellions as rebellions. They worked because they never happened, right? Nat Turner's revolt is actually a revolt, right? This took place in 1831. I talked earlier about how the same year that that happened was when Thomas R. Dew wrote his academic piece, Defending Slavery. That is not a coincidence. But getting back to Nat Turner, um, Nat Turner uh, in 1831, who was a, uh, a, very, a fanatic Christian slave, right, ended up uh, staging a rebellion that was successful. He and his conspirators killed 55 white people before they were stopped. Nat Turner actually was in hiding in the woods for several months, but was later caught and hanged. And as a result of this uh, revolt, there was uh, this sort of wave of panic and fear among the white population that other slaves would do the same thing. Realize that, again, we talked about how the black population and the slave population more specifically outnumbered the white population in some areas of the Deep South. And so with the advent, or rather with the uh, carrying out of Nat Turner's rebellion, there was this fear, right? Power in numbers. If you have if your slaves outweigh you in terms of population and they're mad and they're willing to resort to violence, yeah, there's a reason why the white population was scared, right? But they use uh, they use things like uh, academia, they use things like literature, scholarship, and, and uh, also the prominent members of uh, politics to try to sort of play up the, the threat of violence among the entire slave population in order to prevent abolition. Right, realize that Nat Turner's revolt was an anomaly. This is one of the only slave rebellions that actually occurs and that is somewhat successful from the slave's perspective. And then the Amistad case, which is, uh, I would argue, a lesser known case in history. Uh, this is more t to my local past, right? This, this harkens back to New Haven, Connecticut. So if you're ever there, you can actually see a remake of the Amistad and go to the Amistad Museum. It's pretty cool. But nonetheless, just to highlight the Amistad case really quickly, uh, the Amistad was a ship, actually, that was on its way from the Caribbean and ended up, uh, this, uh, and it was, uh, there were slaves that were uh, being transported and uh, the slaves mutinied, right? They ended up uh, actually successfully killing many of the members of the crew of the ship and then ordered the crew to take them back to Africa. Much to their, uh, much to their, their dismay, rather, the crew actually was still setting sail towards the U.S. They didn't realize it. They thought they were headed back to Africa. The ship eventually docked in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, where uh, eventually there was a, a trial to determine the fate of these of these former slaves. The slaves ultimately argued that they should be free, partially because at this point in 1839, the international slave trade was abolished. So they made the argument that they were being illegally smuggled into the United States, which was ultimately what ended up, uh, which ultimately was what the court ruled, right? Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the defense team, for the slave population was led by none other than former president John Quincy Adams, right? So he actually returned uh, to a role in government after he was president and defended the slaves on the Amistad ship. This story has a happy ending, surprisingly, right? The slaves end up actually winning their freedom and they're returned to Africa, right, where they die naturally. So nonetheless, despite the fact that the story of slavery in the, in the United States many times has a dark ending, with the Amistad case, we see, uh, we see uh, something that was monumental in its time. Uh, my apologies. When I talked about Nat Turner's Rebellion, I didn't have this on here. But this cartoon, if you want to pause it uh, just for a second and think about how this could be used as propaganda, it's very telling. 
right? But this shows us the sort of fear that set in among the Southern population after Nat Turner's revolt. Uh, and let's just briefly talk about the free black population, and then we're going to pick up with a brand new series of videos that actually talk about the uh, the westward expansion, and then we'll talk about the actual lead up to the Civil War next. Okay, so th there's a lot going on here. But nonetheless, it's important for us to realize that approximately a quarter of a million people in the United States lived as free African Americans by the turn of the Civil War, or by the start of the Civil War, that is, right? They largely lived in urban areas, right? The free black communities began to emerge. There was a small black middle class that emerged, right? Many of them were artisans, merchants, and day laborers, right? Some of these free blacks, and actually quite a few of them, actually were born into slavery and later either worked on the side so that they could purchase their freedom from their masters. And some masters actually ended up freeing their slaves in their will, right? So if your master died, uh, you could sometimes face uh, be, be met with freedom uh, upon your master's death, right? So uh, nonetheless, you do see this uh, development of a free black population, but they're never completely safe in their position of society because of the ongoing presence of slavery. And uh, so, and we're also going to see that by the time 1830 rolls around, there's already going to be some black codes, which are sort of uh, these sometimes unofficial laws that restrict the freedom of movement in the African American population. So, you know, you're going to see that free blacks are still not free in the sense of what kinds of jobs they can have, where they can live, right, who they can marry, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, it's really important for us to realize that this population does exist. Right. Uh, let's uh, take a break for now. We'll start picking up with uh, Manifest Destiny and then we'll get back to the abolition movement and then we'll get to the actual lead into the Civil War. So stay tuned and thanks as always for watching.